Welcome to Smart Franchising with Fran Smart. I'm Dan Rowe, and I've masterminded the ascent of local favorites to global dominators. This isn't your usual get to know you chat. We're diving deep. We're revealing the raw truths about franchise wealth building. With over 30 years in the trenches, I'm spilling it all. If you have an appetite for unfiltered tales and the hidden blueprints of franchise prosperity, buckle up. We're diving in. All right, Aisha. I wish I met you 30 years ago when I was first starting out my business and you had this practice because I think of how much more successful our franchisors would have been, our franchisees would have been, and I would have been. So uh, Aisha Bascaro, uh, who's a real operations pro, unlike so many people giving advice nowadays, she actually knows what she's talking about. I follow you on LinkedIn and uh, you created the American Franchise Academy authored a great book I devoured when it first came out, The Franchise Fix. And, um, and I finally met you in your rock star son at an IFA event last year in uh, New Orleans. And I thought you'd be a good uh, interview for the Smart Franchising with Fransmart. Your, your superpower is closing the gap between what the franchisors teach you when you're buying a franchise and what you actually need to be successful with the franchise. So, you know, franchisors, if you want success, you must focus on your franchisee's success and most don't. So to me, there's a gap between what the franchisors train and what the franchisees need to know to be successful. For example, the franchisors teach you to make the burger, to paint the house their way, you know, to do all that other stuff. But that's not why people are buying a franchise. They're buying a franchise to get wealthy, financial freedom, options, control, legacy, family business, whatever. All those things aren't things that franchisors teach. They don't even really teach most of what franchisees go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And almost no franchisors teach franchisees how to own multi-units, which is weird because most of what we sell is big multi-unit deals. And it's true. Most franchisors don't focus on that. Yet you wrote a book, Multi-Unit Franchise Mastery. So with that, sorry about my rant, but this is really important. So please tell us about yourself and, and, and let's get going. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Dan. It was great meeting you too, because I've been following you also on, on LinkedIn and we had chatted a little bit here and there, but never actually met. So it was great to finally meet you in person and very excited to always connect, you know, a, a person's, you know, to their face, whoever, you know, so for me, personal connection is so, so important. 30 years ago, I would have been still learning what I have to learn for me to be able to do what I do now and write the books that I wrote. I was actually going around the world, helping uh, master franchisees open the first unit of these global brands that I used to work for and learning everything that I needed to do about how to do everything the right way. So thank you for having me here today and allowing me to share my message with the world because you are exactly right. I, uh, I have had 35 plus years in the industry. I started when I was 10, so don't do the math now. And uh, I have, I'm one of those rare individuals that has spent their career in very distinct areas. I would say that literally a decade, you know, here and there, I spent actual running operations. My first job was a pizza delivery driver. I became an assistant manager, a unit manager, went from the lowest volume store in Dallas to the highest volume store in Dallas, successfully became uh, a training specialist. And that's when I went into the world helping master franchisees open their first unit successfully. And so I spent and I run um, regions. I was in the Atlanta region for a global brand overseeing over 60 units in three states. I have uh, actually run it for three different uh, distinct brands. And I don't know if you want me to mention the brands sure, or not. Sure, sure. Uh, so I spent uh, Domino's Pizza. I was the director of operations for the Atlanta region overseeing Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee. I did that for almost three years. I run the company restaurants for Popeye's here in Georgia. They're, the Popeye's and the Louisiana Kitchen casual dining test while, while he was still alive. And then I actually run operations for Georgia and Alabama for Olive Garden, Darden Restaurants. And wow. uh, it's amazing, directly responsible for the stores. And my last operator job, I would say, actually was running a brand, a small brand called Pretzel Maker. And uh, after that, I, I was when I ventured on my own. So a third of my career has been running operations, direct financial responsibility and team leading. Another third of my career has been actually working 
uh, the headquarters. Most of the time, reporting directly to, to the chief uh, chief operating officer of Domino's, Pat Knotts at the time, and eventually Patrick Doyle, who became the the president of the company. And then uh, at Popeyes, uh, I, I moved on to support services, also reporting to uh, the COO, Ralph Bauer. And then, of course, um, running a brand. So literally seeing the back of the house of how a franchise brand operates and understands, you know, their commitment to do great, but also the challenges of not being able to get into the franchisees business. So I understand how that machine works. And the other, you know, a third of my career has been in international. I lived in 14 countries. I speak three languages, helping, like I mentioned, master franchisees, franchisors around the world implement these global brands for the first time in their market. And that is such an amazing experience. And that was my third of my career. And so usually people just do one of them. I've done all three and just been very lucky and loved every single moment of it. It came to a time in which I had to decide whether I was going to um, become a franchisee or a, or a business owner or do something else. I literally had to hire a life coach to help me make that decision. And along the way, I started getting phone calls from franchisees, from brands I worked for before, asking me for advice. And it, it was interesting because what they were asking me for was not the brand systems, you know, product, service, image, marketing. They were asking me about how to lead the people, how to control costs, how to, you know, do marketing, how to uh, look at labor costs or food costs and where, where they were going wrong and financials and break-evens and all of these business acumen that they did not have, you know, and 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 that really all those relationships and questions and, and you know, I became the accidental consultant, uh, had me decide, that I really had a, a certain, you know, skill set and experience on uh, this, you know, business acumen that small business owners and franchisees needed to be successful. And it was much more critical when you were multi-unit franchisee. And so one thing led to another. And about eight years ago, I started uh, what is called now the American Franchise Academy. And all we do is we focus on sharing knowledge, resources, uh, files, forms, tools for business leaders, franchisees to be successful. And um, so happy that I did it. Uh, we are filling a gap, like you said, that was needed. And we're having a great time doing it. And really, our purpose is to protect the American dream of business ownership through franchising. That's what we do. Franchisors do a great job at building these amazing brands that bring revenue, which is the oxygen of the business. And now we're helping the franchisees uh, build the systems to be able to turn that revenue into profit that then they can use to scale their organization and truly delegate operations by training their leaders and then have eventually the time freedom that they want and deserve. So that's kind of what we do. And, uh, and we love doing it every day. No, I liked when I read your book, I, I think people that are even thinking about buying a franchise should read your book first, because I think it's a, a little self-awareness about what kind of franchise is right for you. Or are you even right for franchising? What's your personality like? What are the people going to be like that you're going to keep versus the ones that you're going to run off? So you had a lot of good stuff in there. But the irony, too, what, what you're saying is. You work for big companies, talk to big franchisees of big companies, and they still have these issues. So the franchisors doesn't matter. It's not an emerging or a mature brand thing. Most of these people are teaching you the function of the franchise, not the function of how to run the business. And nobody wants one unit franchisees, like not even franchisees. They all want to get 10, 20 units and build a company that they could sell someday. And so it's got to run without them. Right. So, I mean, this is your tools help somebody build a successful franchise. The next goal is really, which is your multi-unit book, is multi-unit mastery is really get the business to the point where it grows without you, almost better without you. And and then if you go to sell your company, no one's ever going to buy it if, if you're uh, tethered to it. So with that, but that that's that's great. So like, tell us more about why you started this and why you wrote the books. Like, what are some of the, what are the, some of the specific things in that gap people don't realize franchisors don't teach you? Yeah, you know, great question. So here at the Academy, we separate the business, the franchise business into two very distinct parts. One of them is the franchise brand, uh, sorry, the franchise systems. 
And what I mean by that, that's the product, the service, the image, the marketing that the franchisor is providing. That is really what you are acquiring when you are acquiring the rights for a franchise brand. You know, just the, the product service image to duplicate that model to then open it for sales, you know, for to acquire revenue, right? To have a product service that customers are willing to give their money in exchange for that product or service. That's one half of the franchise business. That's how we define it. The other half is your business systems, which are the systems that you put in place to control your cost, to hire and inspire your team, to be able to scale your business and to increase revenue year over year. Those are the what we call the business systems that not only turn the franchise revenue into profits, but also the ones that allow you to scale. That other half is what you, like you said, you don't get for the franchisor. It's one of the things that I call one of the biggest secrets in the industry, that when you buy a franchise, you do not get everything you need to be successful. You get a brand, which is amazing because how many individuals in the world actually have the skills and talent or the money to create a product that actually people like, to be able to know where where to get the resources for the vendors in the supply chain, where to get the graphic design, artistic ability to create a logo, a brand, and name the colors that actually look right. And then you have also the interior design skills to actually have a lobby or a dining room or a spa that actually attracts customers and keep, I mean, the amount of skills and abilities that you need to have to actually come up with a proven brand is you know in, tremendous which is why so many businesses fail you know in the first year but a franchisor solved that problem it saved you that time and effort and money but now you have the other half which is your responsibility which is the business systems now you need to go and find how to turn that revenue into profit you need to understand people human beings how to hire them how to interview them how to inspire them how to promote them how to discipline them right all that skills is something that you need to acquire somewhere because the franchise store is not giving you that information and at the end of the day no matter what business you're in you're in the people business and you have to have those skills. And then of course, that's only one part. And then you need to know how to control your costs. Like what is, how to analyze and understand, you know, how labor cost works. How do you define a target? Because everybody's target for labor is different. Now you need to be able to know and define what the labor target should be in a way that you are using the least amount of labor, but still providing good customer service. That's an art, you know, and science. So you need to be able to do that. And then you need to be able to teach your people how to do it and then teach them how to get close to that target. And that's, you know, and now we're going into cost of goods just the same way. And then understanding financials. So many franchisees don't even understand the profit and loss statements. They don't understand variable costs and fixed costs, controllable costs, non-control. I have not met one that has ever uh, actually measured their break-even point. Uh, you know, what is the break-even point of your unit and what does that mean and why is that important? I mean, all of these other business acumen knowledge that you have to have to truly have a successful franchise with confidence, you know? You could be doing well, you have a great brand, but growing that business, you have to really know and understand it in great detail. And so... Um, and so that's, that's how we see the business and, you know, which is what I realized as more and more time came by in the last, you know, like I said, seven and a half, eight years, our eighth anniversary is in July. Um, there is so much that franchises really need to learn. And many of them are successful in spite of not knowing these things, but imagine if everybody knew these things, yeah. this would be easy, you know? No, it's so. like people think you make it up in volume or something. And it's like, no, 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 no. So or I'm not successful. I need to raise my, my sales 10%. No, it's usually cut, make it, I mean, make something more efficient or more effective, or there's other things. But I think a lot of it is people, when they're buying a franchise, they're buying what they think is that paint by numbers checklist. Everything's going to be in there. And it's not the things about making, like I said, the burger or how you wash the dog or do whatever that franchise is about. Like they teach you how to do that. But the other business stuff they don't have. So what are what are like if you think back of all your new clients in the last two or three years, what are three pain points that they all seem to be dealing with and how do you help them with that? Mm. Yeah, in in here is where, you know, we always say that one unit is a job, multiple units is an enterprise. Uh, the biggest issues that are, we have encountered is everybody are dreamers. They're all dreamers, right? They all want to go multi-unit. They understand that multi-unit is the way to achieve, you know, true long-term success. 
but they don't realize until they open the second unit. See, when you have one unit, it's a job. You're there, you're there all the time, most of the time. Um, and you, you know, you know your people, your people know you, you know, you know how to do things instinctively. Maybe you have experience from the back from before. And, um, and then that allows you to do the work. But the moment that you open a second unit, now everything is double. And here is where you don't really, you, you don't really understand how literally the complexity of the business had truly doubled. And sometimes people push through and open two and three and four stores. And that's why I call the hell of two to four stores. Like literally when that's you from two part. stores to yeah. four stores, literally like maybe six stores, it's really is hell because you are just exponentially increasing the number of challenges that you have. If you have not defined the systems to be able to properly delegate how to do the things in your organization. And so that's really the biggest issues that it is that people grow because they believe and know that that's the best way to achieve the time and financial freedom. But to get there, you have to have the systems. And that's where a lot of people don't have because nobody's telling them. The franchise store is not telling them. All they're saying, hey, new location, new store, new team, let's do it, right? And, and you're committed to four or five stores not understanding what that looks like. And you really will not know until you're in the middle of it. And that's when you realize something is missing. This makes Different. no sense. How does other persons that have 20 stores do it and make it look so easy, right? That's because they're missing those those systems and processes and procedures that are not defined or worse yet, not even documented, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you notice the franchisor never misses the procedure about how to get them a royalty. <laughs> oh, no, for sure. <laughs> so, for hey, so, sure. So with... Um, with uh, w like knowing what you know about this, because you're not going to be a successful franchisee. First of all, it starts with even getting the right franchisee. So in your opinion, what do you think it makes, what do you think it takes to become a successful franchisee? So like if you were, if you were vetting people, even before we start this whole journey, like, like, what do you think the attributes are of someone who's likely to become a very successful big franchisee? Mm -hmm. You know, okay, so I would say two different profiles, right? Right now, I know that a lot of brands are focused on multi-unit, um, and but there's two different potential franchisees. One of them is that equity investors that are going to get a big package and grow really fast, and they're different from, you know, the franchisee that is in the market, not the area, and is going to be, you know, very active, you know, active in the business. You know, the profile of that one is going to open one unit and they're going to open two, three, that individual, I would say either one, both of them, first and foremost, need to care about people, truly care about people. I actually had a, I actually had a, a, a call with a potential client one time and he right out told me that he hates the people. He's just doing it for the money. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, first of all, he yeah. could not become a client because we're very careful with who we let in into our mastermind. And uh, second of all, he's struggling, and of course, and he will struggle forever because if, in this business, we still, no matter what, we're still doing it through people. And yeah. we really have to be able to care about them. And if we care about them, we'll make the right decisions to then eventually inspire them. And that's, I would say that's number one. You need to be able to, and know what it means. Like when you are becoming a franchisee, yes, you're saying yes to becoming a business owner. Yes, you're saying to be part of a great network uh, of franchising, but you're saying yes to being a mother, a father, a counselor, a mentor, a teacher to these employees. Because nowadays, not only are we hire them to work, you know, the, the job, but we hire them to even teach them how to be employees. You know, so I would say that is a big one. The next one is, you know, you know, you need to know the, the business acumen. You need to be able to understand that this is a, a small business and they don't need to know everything as if they have the ability to access the knowledge, right? Which is, you know, where the academy came from. But is if if the franchisor or the franchisee does not know resources like ours, like us, they need to have the business acumen because just because you have the money saved from a 25 year career in the corporate world, it does not mean that you know how to be successful with a small business. Managing a multi million dollar budget does not equate to a small business uh, planning, you know, planning for your annual you know, financials. It just does not. And so I, having that business acumen is important. And I know franchisors are trying to achieve that, but not very many people have that business acumen. 
you know? And so really you got to go find a way to give them that or encourage them to, you know, find a ways, you know, to get it. You know, again, yeah, not that I want to talk all about the Academy, but the Academy is one of those sources that that's what we work on. Right. You know, so those two things, willing, somebody that's willing to learn that has demonstrated a history of growth, personal growth and proactive, independent growth, uh, not someone that is used to being an employee only, because if that's the case, when you're a franchisee, you have to be self-driven. You need to be able to be able to be very organized and be able to be proactive in the things and not just wait for somebody to solve the problem. Uh, there's many franchisees that are used to being employees and they want to sit in the franchise waiting for the franchisor to solve the problems. And it really requires a lot of true entrepreneurial spirit uh, to take on whatever challenges there are and look for answers. Uh, I think that how to make a pizza or a spa or a massage, you know, it's, it's, it's teachable. It's yeah. just those, you know, EQ, I guess, skills and understanding to business um, is what you got to really look for, you know, if, if at least the potential of, and then look for resources that can help you develop the franchisees. Yeah. On this, on EQ, what are, what are three pain points that people come to you with? Like, what are there things that come up over and over that like, you know, you're like, oh yeah, I just, I've had four other conversations and half of them were exactly about this. Hmm. Yeah, sometimes, you know, this is, and a lot of this is about leadership lessons and skills, right? A lot of the times human beings want to be liked. We want to be liked. And we think that the way that we're going to be liked is by being super nice, giving people what they want. And sometimes we're doing that and damaging our business. It, uh, having, and I don't want to say confrontation, but having difficult conversations with wives and husbands, partners, managers, district managers, employees, literally having difficult conversations with people. Uh, I think that's one of the very important emo emotional skills that you need to have. And knowing that having those doesn't mean that the people are not going to like you. As a matter of fact, I, I am one to say that if you are strong, if you are fair, if you are objective and you're able to communicate to the people the why of what you're doing, any conversation, no matter how difficult it is, is possible, especially because you know that you're doing it for their benefit too. It's not just for your benefit, you know? And that's the thing that I think that is so important for people to, to know, uh, uh, you know, that, that ability to have those conversations and, and have it land in a way that is still a positive conversation. I mean, I talk to people about, you know, when they don't smell good, you know, when their clothes are dirty, when they are not doing the things that they're supposed to be doing, but then actually find out why that is, you know, and have them realize and acknowledge that really they are responsible. So that's something that that's a skill that it takes time and, 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 and really willingness to even learn it and understand psychologically, you know, and separate yourself from the people and the good that you're doing. But I think hey, that that's one of the ways, one of the things. Mm -hmm. Hey, pretend you're talking to franchisors right now, giving them advice. What are three things that they should teach that they're not teaching now? Mm. You know what? That's I, I would love to be able to tell these. Please, franchisors, if you're listening to me, to help franchisees. First of all, I would tell you, if you are a retail or food service business, where cost of goods is your largest expense, which is true for most franchises mm -hmm. that are, like I said, retail or food service, please give them the ability to know what the ideal and theoretical cost of goods are, please. Because I'm teaching them that that's a franchisor system, please, <laughs> you know? And what I mean by that is you need to have not only the technology and the POS system to calculate your theoretical cost of goods every single day and hour if possible, but then teach them what that means and then teach them about inventory and then the variance between, you know, the usage and the ideal cost and, and that and how to tackle that waste. That is, I think, by far one of my biggest surprises. Now, I come from very large, um, uh, what I call legacy brands that had that. So when I, when I started with Academy and started getting into a lot of other brands, at this point in time, we have serviced hundreds of brands, uh, Dan. I, I cannot tell you how shocked I am when a franchisee comes to me and I say, hey, you know, okay, you're having issues with your cost of goods. What's your ideal? What's your actual? What's the variance? 
don't know, don't know, don't, don't know. know. Yeah. You know, so that will be, that's one. Uh, so definitely that. The second one is, I know that when it comes to labor cost, you know, every model is different and really labor cost is not only driven by the model, but also by the franchisees policies, because a model might say one thing, but if the franchisee decides that the minimum, uh, uh, the, the min I'm going to go into the details now, mm -hmm. but if the minimum shift, if the franchisee decides that their policy is that the minimum amount of hours they're going to schedule employee is four hours then you're going to have more waste than if from a franchisee that the minimum amount of shift, length of shift is two hours, because then you'll have, you know, a lot less, a lot more waste if you have a, a larger minimum shift. So I know and understand that franchisees policies will affect the outcome of the labor cost. But if the franchisor could provide some guidance on how many people to have and when and why, as a guidance so that the franchisee then can then interject their policies and being able to minimize the the expense, uh, reduce the waste, that would be great. Because a lot of people, again, they have no guidance as to what the labor model is. It's funny because franchisors do say, oh, food cost should be X percent and labor cost should be X percent. They say, but based on what? You know, even, even as when it comes to cost of goods, it varies by not only by business and by model, but even by store, even within by, the by product mix. Like, what are you selling? Product like, mix, think, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, so here they are giving them one blanket number, but maybe within my store, if I have four stores, one food cost should be 35%, another one 33, another one 29 because of the product mix. But then yeah. I'm giving my managers the same, the same target. And then for somebody it's easy to make and the other one will be impossible without cheating the customer. So understanding those nuances of the business, you know, and I and I call those a franchisor system because they should be able to give that guidance because a lot of it is based and starts with whatever the brand is. Um, so those are the two things I would say. And the third, you know, I know that in Discovery Day, they do go over a little bit over the financials, but really go through the line by line item of what they mean and what could they potentially negotiate with vendors or which ones they have the empowered to uh, the empowerment to actually go and get better costings to from what they're showing, uh, that will give them a little bit much better view uh, of what their financials will look like and how they actually can control the outcome of the profitability. So really a lot of, I would say, is just that part. Mm -hmm. We're going to stay on financial. We'll, we'll touch on each of these real quick, but, um, and also turnover, like franchisors don't teach, like you're not everyone you hire is staying. It's like, how do you deal with the boom in franchise? in the face of losing people. It's like, it's all something you have to teach. Otherwise someone's going to crash their way through that. So I say, is it a good point? The, you know, I actually, you know, sorry about that, but I actually don't put that on the franchisor because that's about the people. I mean, if, if they would talk about it, that would be amazing. But I really think the franchisee needs to know that, you know, I, I would say that the turnover is the largest yeah. hidden expense in any business, the totally. largest. Yeah, totally. Because it's hidden yeah. in every single line item of your P&L and you're not even looking at it. You have no clue, not measure, no metric, no goal, nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and then there's another subject like, you know, even if the wrong people stayed now, what, what's that cost to your business? But back on the financial. So one thing that I notice, and we make this for our brands and our franchisees, like I'm so surprised when a franchisee opens so many times, the franchisee, even if he's busy his first month, will still say, I'm out of money. I'm not making money. I'm bleeding cash. And it's like, why, what, why do you say that? And they're like, well, I have no money in my checking account. I'm like, well, let me see your financials. And they like, I haven't done my financials. It's like, well, then how do you know that you, how do you know you're not losing, you know, you're not, that you're not making money. And they say, cause I'm out of money. Like I, I don't have as much as I thought, even though I have all, so something's wrong. They get into panic. They get into this downward spiral. It's like, Oh my God. And it's so avoidable. If a franchisor would just, and we help franchisors with this. We said, separate your startup cost, your CapEx in a different thing, in a different account, run your business, right? You got to run the P and L of your business. And so many times, like when a restaurant opens or any franchise opens, but especially a restaurant, the day it opens for the next month or two, you still have invoices. And so what's happening is that, yeah, you might have a busy month, a busy you know month sales, but you've got to make payroll. And, and all of a sudden a big general contractor bill came on a payroll week and you know, whatever. So one simple thing a franchisor can do is have their franchisees set up a a 
CapEx account and track everything separately so that at least if your bank account feels broke or feels empty, at least you can reconcile why. But it's important. And you think about psychology is everything, your state of mind and your, you know, your sense of happiness. What I mean, what kind of reference are you giving if your line's out your door and you feel like you're losing money? You're like, oh, my God, I got my whole life savings into this business lines out the door and I'm still not making money like you totally misfired on an opportunity for that franchisee to give a completely different reference. And then, you know, so one is that you separate your CapEx from your operating like that. That's at least a clearer way of, of painting a financial picture. Another thing that franchisors don't do, and it affects both food and labor is your, um, is uh, your ramp up period, right? So like when you're ramping up, they all say, hey, your prime cost should be this. Well, that's after your place has gotten mature, right? Like that, that, that's after you've gone through grand opening, you have to staff for the sales you want and you have to staff mm -hmm. first. So if you want, if your systems are doing 20 grand a week in sales and you know, you opened up a busy location and you think you're going to do 30 or 40, you can't staff 20 grand. You have to staff 30 or 40. You have to be in, you know, otherwise you're going to get a bunch of customers coming, having a ter terrible experience and leaving. And then you basically govern your sales at a certain level. Two things franchisors could do a lot better job of is, is just, just planning for the opening better, both with that CapEx and PL. and And then the other thing is they have to be able to tell a franchisee, your food and labor costs, your first 90 days are going to be whacked. Here's why. Here's what it's going to look like. Here's why, you know, you have to have extra people. You're going to have turnover, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then you also have to have a plan in place to deal with the turnover. If you don't have a plan to recruit while you're busy, because so many times these guys are barely hanging on mm -hmm. and they don't have time to go find new people. They don't have time to go recruit. So I don't know, like you just sparked, the, sparked those, those, those two things in my mind. And then the turnover. Yeah. I mean, they, mm -hmm. nobody yeah. teaches turnover as if, as if every employee you hire is staying and nobody trains people for that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. A lot of franchisees use the financials basically to pay taxes, Dan. Yeah. They don't really use the financials as a way to really, as a dashboard, to see where you are, where the business is. And uh, and that's absolutely critical. The, it, and they should actually, not only should they um, use it to analyze that, but they ha should have, when you first open a franchise, you should have a business plan, a 12-month business plan, which I assume they're submitting that when they're getting the franchise in the first place. And what happens with that plan? Do they just throw out the window? Or is there any feedback in there as far as when the first month's what it should be? I don't really know about that. But uh, if you have a financial plan, that's something that we teach our franchisees. Every October, we have our, uh, our three-day financial planning for the next year. And uh, so they have a clear picture. Or if they meet that financial plan, where they're going to be by December of the next year. And it's a month to month, you know, plan so that they can actually month to month, look at where the plan was, look at the final financials, compare those and see where the variances are. And they move on to the next one. The same thing should be when you open a new unit. If you have a new unit, you should have a fully, you know, developed financial plan, especially if you have over prior units where you can have a very accurate one. You know that at the beginning, you're going to potentially staff for more sales than you, you know, than you, you maybe that you get. Maybe you do get those sales, but either way, your labor is going to be high. But if you have a financial plan that shows you what you did and why you did it, when you compare the actuals, they, it will tell you the story. It will calm your nerves because you say, oh, mm -hmm. okay, what happened was that I staffed for 30 and I got 25. So turnover will happen. So people will leave. The better ones will stay. And then we'll continue. And then as we need, we're going to hire more people. But you need to have that knowledge and understanding. And when you first open a new, your first franchise, you do not have that. Uh, the, on the first unit, you definitely do not have that knowledge and information. And so a lot of uh, scare, you know, stress, overwhelm happens. I have some people that have reached out to me in that level. And, you know, sometimes they call me and they reach out to me when it's too late. When they tell me I'm this much in debt, this much behind in royal... There's nothing I can do that at that point. You know, yeah, it's just yeah. so, so sad when that happens. But yeah, yeah. Hey, you're right about the financials. And do you recommend people keep two sets? One, keep a set of financials so you don't pay taxes. I got that. But then the other part is there needs to be a set of financials. If you ever do go sell your company, obviously you can't show that set of financials. You need to show the upside. But even having that just for sanity check or something, just, I mean, nobody buys a franchise for a stack of contracts and all the liabilities that comes with owning a franchise they're buying it thinking they're getting to a new place in life and there's just so many of these avoidable uh 
uh, problems that, that freak people out and they never get there. Yeah, I don't really, rec- I don't say that you should have two sets of, of, of financials. I say, you know, you should have the right one and put the right things in it. Um, you need to understand what it says, you know, like don't have your accountant do it. Like you have to do it. When we do it, we do it with our clients. Wow. We, we step by step. This is what this means. This is what that means. You know, tell me about the history. Tell me about your first opening or your last opening. What happened? Oh, consider that. Might... Like really understanding the business at, at, at a very detailed level. And I know that it sounds like it's a lot, but if you do that in the first you know, a few, a couple of years of you being in business, by the time you're 20, you have 20 units, it would be easy. But if you really spend the time to really understand anything that you don't understand clearly so that you can explain it to somebody else, you need to learn it, understand it, see the history, see what happened, why it happened, dig deep. Because once you get that level of knowledge and understanding, you'll have it forever. And then you will not have the questions or the concerns because you will know what is happening and what to do about it. So I really think that that, that and some people are just too busy. You know, it's, you know, it's kind of like whenever, you know, we have all these, you know, we sign to a new platform and oh, oh here's all sign this agreement for all the, what do you call it? All that big old 10 page long, you know, uh, requirements. And you say, yeah, sure. I, I read it. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. it's like that. They don't read the, they don't read the, the franchise, the franchise agreement and they don't read their financials. It's like, oh my yeah. God. So Hey, yeah. hey, where's give us an example or two of where somebody was off track and you helped them get their business back on track. What are the things that are easy for you to work with them on to get them back on the track that they wanted to get on? Mm-hmm. So so we focus on the on the business management systems, right? Anything to um, to manage the employees, to manage your revenue, to manage your financials, to and to scale into multi-unit and, and build your leadership organization. So I'm not a financial advisor, so I don't know, I cannot advise you that I'm not a banker, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an HR specialist. Uh, for that, you really need to go to experts on that. What what we do is when people are in that two to five unit of hell and they don't know how to ring this bear back and how to control it, uh, that's kind of what we help. So, you know, different ways. I had a client that joined us before he acquired seven units. He acquired them all in one chunk, uh, but he actually looked for knowledge. He a financial ba- uh, banker background. Uh, mm-hmm. He did grow up uh, in a franchise with uh, his family actually making sandwiches, but he knew that all his parents allowed him to do was make sandwiches. They never gave him a view into, you know, the business side. And even though he went into financial and banking and that's how he saw how many franchises were successful, you know, it's how he decided to actually he did is acquire his parents uh, seven unit brand. Uh, franchise. And so, but before when he was in the process of doing that, when he found me and said, Hey, Aisha, this is my background. I know how to make sandwiches. I know how to do the finances in the back. I don't, that thing in between of the people and the structure and the training and all that. I don't know anything about that. And so that really is our sweet spot. If you, if you have one unit or about to acquire one or more, and you want to know how to set the systems in place so that you can define and document the processes and procedures and policies that you need to have in place so that you can train your people and delegate operations so that you can go into multi-unit and scale. That's what we do the best. So here's an example. Uh, within two years, he went from zero to, I think, 20 now, 22. Um, nice. And he was able to do it that fast because he properly implemented all those policies, processes, and procedures in place into an organization that already existed. So he had to even change the culture and roll all these things out and change the way things were going. And it worked out so well that he's at 20 and looking for more. His goal is 100 now. You know, nice. Now we have a different franchisee that had a uh, also multiple units. I think he had like eight smaller brand. Um, he was having challenges with it. And you know, when he joined us, uh, we taught him about the systems and processes. He found out, you know, what, where the issues were and why they were where they were. And he realized that he was not with the brand that he was going to be able to scale. And so he implemented the systems, cleaned it up, you know, create structure and eventually sold that brand and went on to move on and do other things. And so, you know, like that, we have, like I said, tons and tons of stories and our, our, 
the usual is, you know, franchisees, like I mentioned, that are wanting to grow or are in the middle of growth and they can't sleep. They don't have vacations. They cannot leave. They are being buried in the phone calls because they don't have those systems in place. That's what we help them with. Yeah. So they've got to be able to take a step backwards to get several forward. And, you know, yeah. So to summarize, franchisors should acknowledge that the hardest part for a franchisee is is going from two to four from i guess one to you know five or six until you've got that multi-unit team and and that your business is working off of systems off of systems and so yeah most we usually don't... say the first district manager area like in and in, in how many units it depends on the volume and the cash flow of the business that is able when are you able to hire that district manager yeah. So really from one unit to the first district manager, that, that is the, that's the hard work right there. But uh, like if, fran if a franchisee, if he can't leave for, she, he or she can't leave for a month and go on an amazing vacation, take their family on a vacation. If they can't do that because they're worried their business will crumble, they don't have a business. They have a exactly. job. They, yeah. They bought exactly. a job. So, and I think that would be, that would be a great, a great measure. Have you gone on vacation in the last year? The answer is no. Then, then you need systems. Basically. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. that that's good. This is helpful. So, um, and so you have three hundred plus videos. Is that what you were saying? You've got three hundred videos and anecdotes and tips and tricks. Yeah, How yeah, many. People... Yeah, a, a few years, a couple of two or three years back, I started a YouTube channel. Uh, where I started to share, you know, tips and, you know, best practices for franchisees. Our, like I said, our focus is the franchisee. Uh, there's so many people that are focused on helping franchisors in, in all kinds of ways. And, and we made a conscious effort of conscious choice to help franchisees. And so you're going to go to our YouTube channel, the American Franchise Academy, and you're going to see lots and lots of videos really guiding franchisees on how to become you know, top performing multi-unit franchisees. And yeah, so that's how, how we do. And we have also another playlist uh, where we have actually what we call the franchise wisdom, where we have interviewed several franchisees that have been successful at becoming a multi-unit, you know, franchise. And some of them are retired. Some of them are doing it right now. So yes, yeah, success leaves clues. Like, I don't know why, if I were buying a franchise, the first thing I'd want to know are who the most successful franchisees and like, what can I learn from them? So there's so much in making your best, make them your best friend. <laughs> yeah. But there's so many of them out there. I find that they're great. Like I've approached huge, several hundred unit, one franchisee with over a thousand units. They're, they're kind, they're nice. They understand what you're going through. And I find people in this community, give you advice. They'll give it if you ask for it. So yeah, they, they all want to help. They just don't have, they just don't have enough time to give it to them in a structured way like we do. But absolutely all franchisees, everybody, if they can help, they will help. I have not met one that was not willing to have a conversation with you and answer a question or two for sure. Yeah. So on your other book, The Multi-Unit Franchise Mastery, I'm going to order that next. What is one or two good lessons someone learns from that? What's, what's one or two good things that they can pick up to get through that purgatory of two to four stores? Yeah, you know, great question. Um, in that book, I actually show the progression on when you should be adding to your infrastructure. Okay, uh, in in that book, it really share it, it really talks about you know the view of a multi unit organization and how you have the operations and how you have your admin and then you have your you know your district manager responsibilities. And it talks about when do you start adding, you know, internal employees versus external employees and how to scale the organization and what to, what's, whose responsibility to do what? Because I think that's one of the questions I had a call with today with a franchisee and I said, look, you, you know, they were already at nine stores. I said, well, you need to hire a district manager. I said, we don't even know what the district manager does. And I said, yeah, so that's, you know, and it's true. That is, uh, um, uh, because they're so, they're not that, even though there are a lot of them, but they're not so many that the franchisor can, even because of joint employer, develop a training program for district managers anyways. So, yeah. um, so that's what the book does. It, it really gives you a pretty good perspective of what is the role of the owner and the, the, the overhead and, and office support and support team and the district manager 
in relations to each other. So that gives you the picture of, okay, okay, this is what it should look like. And yeah, maybe at the beginning, I'm doing everything, but then as I'm growing, then I can add this particular resource that might be external at the beginning. And only once I get to a certain number of stores, will they, would I bring them internally? Like literally, how do you take those steps to grow and understand that that's the, that's the, that's the journey, right? Because when you yeah. know where you're going, it's easier to accept where you are right now and do the hard work because you know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel where you're going to be. But a lot of people don't even know where that end of the light, tunnel light looks like, you know? And so that's what that yeah. book, I think, uh, does for people that are or want to become multi-unit. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember when I met you, I told you, I think franchisors should hire you. And you said, no, our customers are franchisees. And I, I'm not to argue with you. I think franchisors should hire you because <laughs> you're like this middleware because most people that work for franchisors, most of the people supporting franchisees, they don't know what you know, right? So like the people that are the area rep, the franchise support reps, whatever you call them, franchise business consultants, mm -hmm. they don't have your background. So they can only give superficial um, advice and insight to their franchisees. So mm -hmm. yeah, no, this is well, great. I would wow. tell you that franchisors have actually looked for me. And, and obviously I don't, don't not talk to them. Obviously I, I want to help everybody and helping, you know, we are franchisee advocates, franchise source supporters. I love franchise source, but because of them, the American dream of business ownership through franchising is possible. So, Hey, love you guys, ladies. Yeah. Um, I, I have a couple of them approach me and I have actually a couple of them that any of their franchisees that want to go multi-unit, they're required to go through our mastermind program. Yeah, because good. they don't good. they have had failures in the past and they wanted to avoid that. I say, hey, they found me. We have a conversation. We tell them what we do. And they say, you know what? Oh, my. Anybody wants to say they want to be multi unit. They're going to go through, through your program. Other franchisors do reach out and we do, you know, training. Sometimes we go do presentations for the conferences and things like that. So I do I do support franchisors for sure. Um, yeah. we're focused on look, is reaching out to franchisees, but if any franchisor out there would like to have a conversation and how we can help them, I'll be happy to. Aisha Biscaro. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. You were awesome. Appreciate you pitching in and we will stay in touch. Look forward to seeing you again. All right. Thank, thank you, Dan. You. Thank you. See you, see you in the other conference. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, thanks for tuning in to Smart Franchising with Fran Smart. I'm your host, Dan Rowe. If you enjoyed today's episode, this podcast is only going to get better. Please like, comment, and subscribe to hear more from the most successful franchisors and franchisees, and we'll see you next time.